Day nine of our 14 concepts. Day nine already. We're at free cash flows. Key for today is to understand the two formulas. Understand free cash flow to the firm. Understand free cash flow to equity. And if you understand them, you'll be able to answer the questions that ask you what affects them, what doesn't affect them, rather than what's the formula. So as always, we'll start with the formula, but we'll break it down and get behind it. Here is free cash flow to the firm. Let's look at the letters in FCFF, and that's going to help us understand what's going on. First of all, the CF, that's cash flow. I don't think that's going to surprise anybody. But that is step one. We need to make sure we're working with a cash flow. Step two, it is to the firm. So step two, we need to make sure, yes, we have a cash flow, but secondly, that cash flow is to the firm. Finally, we need to make sure that this cash flow is free. So we're going to talk freedom only in terms of cash flow. It's not going to get too philosophical, but it has to be free in that the firm can give it back to providers of debt. So how do we get there? Let us start with net income. Not the greatest place to start, but that's often where we are forced to start. So we're at net income. Step one, that is not a cash flow. That's the problem. So we need to turn net income into a cash flow. Your brain says to you, okay, I can do that. What I'll have to do is adjust for any non-cash charges. The classic example, often the only one you'll get, is depreciation. It's a charge. It's been deducted to get to net income. So you have to add it back to get to a cash flow. Imagine during the year you spent nothing, but you charge depreciation. You'd have a negative profit. Despite having zero cash flow, you add back that charge. Secondly, we have movements, don't we, in working capital, accounts receivable, accounts payable, inventory. They are changing. We'll have to adjust for those. But once we've done that, yay, we have a cash flow. But step two, we need to make sure that that cash flow is to the firm. That means it's available. It's a big bag of cash sat there. Let's say it's dollars available to pay back providers a debt and equity. So it is before we've paid back either. The problem with net income, again, another problem is that it's after interest. So we have to add back interest. We add it back after tax. We want to get a figure that is before interest, but after tax. So add it back by multiplying it into one minus T where T is the tax rate. That will make sure we have this bag of cash that was available to everybody. Finally, we must be free. What does that mean? Well, the firm is going to have to invest to keep going forward. And it's going to invest in two things. It has to be operationally viable. It has to keep investing in working capital. And it has to keep investing in fixed capital assets to keep going. Now, the good thing is we've actually in step one by getting to a cash flow figure already adjusted for working capital. There you go. But we will need to adjust for our fixed capital. Although we have a big bag of cash, some of that has to be paid to buy assets to keep going. So we'll deduct whatever we paid to invest in assets. But that makes sure it's free. We made sure it was before interest. It was available to everybody, providers of debt and equity, and we adjusted for non-cash. So we now have a cash flow that is to the firm that is free. We have free cash flow to the firm. Now, that was a bit of a pain, particularly starting with net income, having to add back non-cash charges and having to adjust for working capital investment. If only there were a quicker way than starting with net income and adjusting for all our non-cash items. Well, of course, there is just start with CFO. If we start with CFO, we've taken net income, we've adjusted for working capital, and we've adjusted for non-cash charges. So you're almost there. All you need to do is add back interest after one minus T or into one minus T and knock off fixed capital investment. And you have free cash flow to the firm. That is a much quicker way of doing it. Only little caveat in there. Just be careful. This assumes that we need to adjust CFO by adding back interest. Don't do that. Don't add back your interest 
if what? Well, if it's not in CFO, if it's not in CFO, then we don't need to add it back. Is that a possibility? Well, yes, it's not our place today to go through a really tedious list of all the differences in accounting standards between US and IFRS, but under IFRS, it may be that that interest has not been deducted in getting to CFO. But there you go, that's free cash flow to the firm broken down. If you think about it in these three steps, honestly, it will help. Now, what about free cash flow to equity? Let's stick with our free cash flow to the firm, which we've got a CFO plus interest into one minus T, assuming interest was part of CFO minus fixed capital investment. We wanna go from that to FCFE. What's the difference? Well, the difference is any transactions we have with providers of debt because free cash flow to equity says, okay, you had your big bag of cash here that was available to providers of debt and equity. I want to see what that bag of cash looks like after your transactions with providers of debt. So get rid of them. Well, it's a two-way street. On the one hand, your providers of debt demand interest. You pay them interest. But secondly, and who knows which way it went during the year, but either they give you cash or you have to repay them. So either you've got proceeds or you've got repayments of debt. So all you have to do is adjust for those two. Now your providers of debt have gone and you're left with a bag of cash for providers of equity. So how do I need to adjust my free cash flow to the firm formula? Still start with CFO because I still need to be a cash flow. But at the minute it's to the firm, we need to sort this out. To sort it out, well, it's got to be after I've paid interest. So don't be adding back interest into one minus T. CFO is after interest. Again, with a caveat that if you're looking at the lunatic IFRS, maybe they haven't. But assuming CFO is after interest, it's already been deducted. We want it to be deducted to get to FCFE. So don't add it back. Secondly, we need to take into account any proceeds from issuing debt or any repayments. So we just need an extra term in there, plus or minus, well, plus proceeds or minus repayments. And that is going to do it. That's what our FCFE is going to look like. CFO makes sure we've got a cash flow, not adding back interest, but including net borrowing or deducting any net repayment. Make sure it's to equity. To make sure it's free, we are still deducting fixed capital investment. And we're in business. You now have the formulas, hopefully, hooked into your brain. Not just a list of letters, but hooked into your brain. So now when you see a set of numbers, you can easily calculate. Now, here are some numbers you can practice on. I'm not going to walk through the whole thing, but obviously you can pause the video and enjoy it at your leisure. But you should see if you apply the formula correctly, FCFF comes to 51725 using CFO. 51725. FCFE using CFO 55,000. So FCFF, FCFE, enjoy the formulas. Make sure you get behind them, understand them, and you should be able to answer the tricky questions of what affects FCFF, what affects FCFE, and what doesn't. One of the most common questions is looking at interest and its impact on FCFF. It is before interest. Changing interest has no impact. If you don't believe me, try this. EBIT 100, 100. A company that pays interest of 50 or one that pays 30. Tax for both 20%. That'll be 10 here, 14 here. 40 is net income, 56 is net income. Take net income and add back interest into one minus T. What you're gonna get in both cases is 80, 80. If it's before interest, interest does not impact it. 